In this video, we're going to do a wrap up from our types of bonding lab. We're going to look at the different types of bonding and how they affect the properties of different materials. So first thing we need to understand is what the formulas mean. You've seen chemical formulas for a long time, and some of you may understand what they mean, but I'd like to review it. So it tells us what elements make up the compound and how many of each type of those atoms there are in a compound. So here's an example, C2H2F, and you can see that it tells you the elements that are in the compound, carbon, hydrogen, and fluorine, and then those little subscripts tell you how many of each there are. So in this compound, there are two carbons, two hydrogens, and four fluorines. Sometimes formulas have the same element that appears more than once. And this tells us something about the structure of the compound. We're not there yet, but we'll get to this shortly. And you can see in this formula, you've got hydrogen here and hydrogen here. And when that happens, you want to add those subscripts. So one nitrogen, four plus one, so five hydrogens, and one oxygen in this formula. The other thing that can happen is that formulas have parentheses. For example, uh, aluminum and then this NO3 thing is called a nitrate. We'll be learning about that in this unit. So the NO3 is in parentheses and you've got a three outside. That means that the number outside the parentheses multiplies the number of each of the atoms inside. So in this formula, you have one aluminum, three nitrogens, and nine oxygens. Let's go through a couple of examples. What I'd like you to do is pause the video between each example, try to figure out how many of each element are in a formula, each atom, and then start the video again so you can check. Pause. Okay, so in this example, you've got three carbons, eight hydrogens, and one oxygen. Let's try another one. Okay, pause it. In this example, you have one magnesium, one sulfur, and four oxygens. So far, so good. Let's try another one. Pause it. Okay, so in this formula, this is a little more complicated because it has the parentheses. There's one calcium, there are two oxygens. Remember that that two outside of the formula provide, multiplies each of the elements inside, and that means that we have two hydrogens. Let's try another one. All right, for this one, remember that the element shows up more than once. So we've got two nitrogens, four hydrogens, and three oxygens. A couple more. Try this one. All right, in this formula, you have three magnesiums, two phosphoruses, because that two applies to the P and the O, and then you have a total of eight oxygens, because two times four is eight. Okay, last one. All right, so for this one, let me move this down. For this one, we have FeNO3-3. So we have one Fe. We have three nitrogens. And we have nine oxygens. And it's really important to write those parentheses with the subscripts outside because that does also tell us something about the structure of our formula. And you'll learn more about that in our next unit and when we start talking about acids and bases. All right, now let's talk about, we, we've experimented to figure out some different things about the compounds that you looked at in types of bonding, but let's talk specifically about what they mean. So conductivity, when we think of conductivity, we think about how well something conducts electricity. And in our case, we were interested in how well a solution of our compound conducted electricity. And so you have to think about what you need to conduct electricity.
a lot of times people will say electrons, and that's true in some cases. But really what you need is to have moving charges. Electrons are moving charged particles, but they're not the only ones that can conduct electricity. So things that have really high conductivities have lots of charged particles that can move around. So they have the charge and they can carry it from one place to another. Let's talk about some conductivity terminology. One word you may have heard before is electrolyte. And that's a compound that will conduct electricity when it's dissolved in water. You may have heard of an electrolyte in uh, some of these sports drinks like Gatorade. And so you probably are wondering if Gatorade will conduct electricity. Well, if somebody has some, we'll give it a try at school. All right, when we talk about something being a strong electrolyte, that means it conducts electricity really well. When we have something that's a weak electrolyte, it means it conducts electricity a little bit, but not as well as something that's a strong electrolyte. And then when we have a non-electrolyte, it really does not conduct electricity at all. All right, so let's talk about what melting point means. We know that when something melts, uh, it, the forces between the little particles of our compound are broken. So when we go from a solid to a liquid, those little atoms and molecules can spread apart a little more easily. And so when we have things that have low melting points, we don't have to put as much energy into them to break those attractions. And so that means that they have weak attractions between those little particles. All right, let's talk about appearance because that's really important. Regular shapes are really important in science. And when we have something that's regular at the visible level, it means that it's also regular at the microscopic and atomic level. So think back to biology. If you have, if you look at people, while we all look very different and unique, there are a lot of things about us that are very regular. We typically have two eyes, a nose, and a mouth on our face. We have ears, hands, arms, legs, feet. Uh, our bodies are have a lot of similarities even though we look really different. And if you think about that, think about what has to happen on a cellular level for that to happen. You have to have cells that get together to make up organs and the organs make up the systems and the systems make up the body. So when you're talking about having that regularity, the cells are very similar to each other and then they form the little parts that come together to make us all look like people. All right, so let's talk about why things like salt, aspirin, and zinc have really different properties. Leave a couple of lines blank in your paper. We're gonna come back and fill that in in a few minutes. All right, so first of all, let's talk about things like sodium chloride. Things like sodium chloride have really high melting points. You put them on the hot plate and it just sat there and didn't really do anything. It doesn't conduct electricity in its solid form. Okay, so you can't run a electric current through a salt block. They're very strong electrolytes, so they do conduct electricity well in solution, just not in their solid form. And they also tend to have a very regular shape. They're always made from a metal and a nonmetal. If you look at our example, sodium chloride, sodium is a metal, chlorine is a nonmetal. And what happens when those compounds form is that one thing loses an electron. Remember that we've talked about how, com how elements lose electrons or gain electrons to be more stable. So in the case of these types of compounds, the metal loses the electrons while the nonmetal gains the electrons. So the metal gives them away, the nonmetal accepts the electrons. They don't poof, disappear, they just go from one atom to the next. So Na, remember, it will lose one electron and form a positive ion, and chloride will gain an electron. It gains the electron from sodium, and then it forms the chloride ion. And when it makes those ions, those are charged particles. When we put them in water, they uh, dissolve and conduct electricity. When they're in the solid form, you can see that they form what we call 
this structure it's got here it's got those chlorine atoms that are blue and these little yellow sodium atoms and you can see that if you look at this central atom here the chlorine it's surrounded on every side six sides by sodium ions so that negatively charged chlorine ion has several positive sodium ions attracted to it remember that opposite charges attract like the protons and electrons so it works the same way with oppositely charged uh, ions. And you can see that on the microscopic or atomic level that it forms this nice little cubical shape. And when we look at the grains of salt with our little magnifying glass, we can see that they look like little tiny baby cubes. So that structure carries through. All right. So they have that regular crystal structure, and it comes from this repeating pattern of the ions that's called a crystal lattice structure. And you can see, I always think it kind of looks like a little jungle gym. So it's kind of like you used to have on the playground when you were a kid. They're probably too dangerous now. But it forms just this little cubicle structure. We can see its appearance on the atomic level is similar to its appearance on the visible level. So there aren't a specific number of atoms in a crystal. They just continue to repeat and grow. We're just showing a really small section there. So we don't want to say that there are 28 billion sodium ions and 28 billion chloride ions. We just use what's called an empirical formula. And that's the lowest whole number ratio of atoms. So the ratio of atoms in sodium chloride is one to one. So one sodium atom for every one chloride ion. And we always call this type of compound a salt. So when you hear of salt, we always think of sodium chloride, the salt that we eat. But we also realize that the salts are any of this type of compound. When we melt things like sodium chloride, it has to break the bonds that hold the compound together. These bonds are really strong. They're extremely strong. And so they are very hard to break. And so the melting point is really high. You have to put a lot of energy in to make those types of chemicals melt. Here's a little chemistry humor for you. Remind me to talk about this in class. Hopefully this one is one that you find funny. Most of my students like this one. Okay, so back in those couple of lines that you left blank a minute ago, you're going to put ionic bonding. And what happens is that's bonding between ions where atoms transfer electrons. One gives the electrons, the other one takes the electrons. And those are things like salt. I want to show you an animation of the ionic bonding so that you can see how those bonds work. And if you go to my PowerPoint on Moodle, you can click the link and just play around with it yourself a little bit. Okay, so with chemical bonds, they are the attractive forces that hold the atoms together. And there are three types. We're just going to look at ionic right now. So when we click on ionic bonding, you can see we have a metal and a nonmetal, a sodium ion and a chlorine chloride ion. So when we have those two atoms, they combine to form sodium chloride. And let's look at how that happens. So the sodium atom has 11 electrons and 11 protons. The chlorine atom has 17 electrons and 17 protons. So the sodium only has one valence electron. So it's got only one electron in that outermost energy level. And so what it does is it gives its electron to chlorine. And what happens is chlorine accepts it. It has seven valence electrons. It wants eight. Remember the octet rule. It needs eight to be more stable. When it gains that electron, it becomes more stable with that full valence shell. And since sodium has lost an electron, you can see it lost a whole energy level. And now it has eight electrons in its outside valence shell. So then you've got this sodium ion that has a plus one charge. 
the chlorine ion that has a negative one charge. And they're attracted because one is a positively charged uh, ion and the other one is negatively charged. And that's a really strong, tight bond. All right, let's go back to our PowerPoint.